coming up on The World Today. U.S. Senate set to vote on President Donald Trump's Supreme Court pick. The Australian city of Melbourne to exit lockdown after recording no new COVID-19 cases. Press jubilations in Chile after an overwhelming majority votes in support of rewriting the country's constitution. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Akaite Afia. We begin today in the United States where Republican senators are expected to confirm Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court later today. President Trump named Barrett as a proposed replacement for liberal justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died last month at the age of 87. There has been fierce opposition to Barrett's nomination so close to a presidential election from Democrats, as Supreme Court appointments are for life and the body rules on some of the most contentious issues in American society. Her confirmation would give the nine-member court a 6-3 conservative majority, swinging its ideological balance for potentially decades to come. Motion is agreed to. Well, let's continue on in the United States as a senior aide to President Donald Trump has conceded that the government is not going to control the pandemic. Instead, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows says COVID-19 could only be defeated by, quote, mitigation areas like vaccines and therapeutics. His remarks come as coronavirus cases surge in the U.S. nine days before the presidential election. In an interview with CNN, Mr. Meadows says control of the virus is not a realistic goal because it's a contagious virus just like the flu. However, Democratic presidential challenger Joe Biden says the White House is waving the white flag of defeat. He adds that Mr. Meadows' comments show that the Trump administration had given up on their basic duty to protect the American people. China is once again mass testing an entire city for the coronavirus amid a regional outbreak in the Xinjiang province. Around 4.7 million people in Kashgar are being tested, with 138 asymptomatic cases found so far. China has largely been successful in bringing infection rates down, but there continues to be small outbreaks. Xinjiang is home to China's mostly Muslim Uyghur minority, which rights group says is being per persecuted by the government in Beijing. Schools in Kashgar have been closed and residents are not allowed to leave the city unless they have a negative test report. The Australian city of Melbourne will exit lockdown from Wednesday after recording no new COVID-19 cases for the first time since June. Victoria State was the epicenter of Australia's second wave, accounting for more than 90% of its 905 deaths. The state capital, Melbourne, went into lockdown 111 days ago, enforcing home confinement, travel restrictions, and closing stores and restaurants. There are 91 active cases across the state, and there are zero new cases across our state. The last time we recorded zero cases was 139 days ago, on the 9th of June. There are seven Victorians in hospital, and I'm pleased to say none of them are receiving intensive care. We are able to say that now is the time to open up. Now is the time to congratulate every single Victorian for staying the course. Now is the time to thank every single Victorian family for being guided by the data, the science and the doctors. Not letting our frustration get the better of us, but instead uh, proving equal to this wicked enemy. Indeed, better than this wicked enemy. Meanwhile, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres and World Health Organization Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus have called for joint anti-epidemic efforts from countries as well as for effective and fair distribution of vaccines. The leaders made the remarks when addressing the opening ceremony of the World Health Summit via videos. The World Health Summit, started in 2009, is a co-sponsored by Germany, France, the European Union and the WHO. 
Vaccines, tests and therapies are more than life savers. They are economy savers and society savers. There is no choice between saving people's lives and saving jobs. Protecting people from the virus is the best way to keep schools open and businesses running. It will prevent the virus from spreading even more widely and returning in wave after wave. If and when we have an effective vaccine, we must also use it effectively. And the best way to do that is to vaccinate some people in all countries rather than all people in some countries. Well, let's check out other COVID-19 updates from other countries. Here's a report on the COVID-19 global update. Spain's health ministry says the country's coronavirus death toll nears 35,000. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez announced the new state of emergency on Sunday in an effort to curb soaring coronavirus infections, imposing local nighttime curfews and banning travel between regions in some cases. The measures went into force from Sunday night and will require all regions except the Canary Islands to impose a nighttime curfew and limit the number of people allowed to mid to six. Well, a top French health official is warning the government that France may be experiencing 100,000 new COVID-19 cases per day. That's twice the latest official figure. France, the Eurozone's second biggest economy, is currently examining whether to tighten lockdown measures, having already imposed nighttime curfews on major cities, including Paris. The health ministry reported on Sunday a record 52,010 new confirmed coronavirus infections over the past 24 hours as a second wave of cases surges through Europe. Shouting for freedom, hundreds of people took to the streets to protest against restrictions brought in to combat rising coronavirus infections in the southern city of Naples. <laughs> For the third night running, unemployed and people fearing for their businesses challenged the 11 p.m. curfew that is in place. The Financial Times says the COVID-19 vaccine being developed by the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca PLC produces a robust immune response in elderly people, the group at the highest risk of COVID-19. <laughs> The vaccine triggers protective antibodies and T-cells in older age groups. That's what the Financial Times said, citing two people familiar with the finding, encouraging researchers as they seek evidence that it will spare those in later life from serious illness or death from the virus. Meanwhile, U.S. infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci says it would be clear whether a COVID-19 vaccine was safe and effective by early December. But he says any significant distribution to the wider populace would not be likely until later in 2021. I think we will know. Yes, I, I, I believe he said that correctly. We will know whether a vaccine is safe and effective by the end of November, the beginning of December. Over 225 people have so far died from coronavirus in the United States. ready for them by the end of the year. Well, as we mentioned earlier, Republicans in the, in the Senate are expected to confirm Amy Coney Barrett as the new Supreme Court justice later today. So to get a little bit more on this story from our Washington correspondent, Maria Bird joins us now. Maria, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Maria, can you give us a sense of what to expect when the Senate votes today? Well, it looks as if we are expecting a confirmation. Um, I think that this was something that uh, the Republicans, but most importantly, President Trump was very eager to move through because with the House and with the Senate have a Republican majority, uh, this is most likely going to be a confirmation uh, for her. And we'll probably see uh, the swearing in ceremony later on today. Well, Democrats have so far failed to draw Barrett on issues like climate change, health care and so on. Is this likely to have any effect on the vote today? 
This is likely not to have effect. I think that um, the Democrats um, are in a position now where they are, you know, not hopeful that this will not happen before uh, the election. And so they are just going to allow, you know, what is what the process will be um, and look at other ways to address uh, the Supreme Court uh, come in uh, the, uh, the next administration. Well, speaking of the next administration, let's speculate a little bit here. Can a Biden presidency, and I mean, that's assuming that he wins the election in November, upset the ideological balance of the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, um, you know, as he stated before, he's not going to necessarily say that court packing is what he's going to be uh, focused on. Uh, but it's very highly likely that we could potentially see um, an additional Supreme Court justice added. I mean, in the Constitution, that would be a constitutional change. But again, I think that Democrats are looking at ways. But there are other Democrats that are saying that's not the way to move forward. And so I think that will definitely be, if we do have a change in administration, uh, that will be one of the key areas uh, that will be focused on very early on. But if not, uh, we will see that President Trump uh, will obviously have a court that will be likely um, able to support his initiatives and his referendums moving forward. Well, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on the situation to see what comes out of the vote later today. Maria, thank you so much for joining us and stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Meanwhile, there is widespread jubilation in Chile after voters endorse rewriting the country's constitution, which dates to the military rule of General Augusto Pinochet. With almost all the ballots counted, 78% had voted yes in a referendum that was called after mass protests erupted over inequality in the country. President, President Sebastián Piñera raised the praised the peaceful vote, saying it is, quote, the beginning of a path that we must all walk together. The referendum, which was originally due to be held in April, was postponed to October due to the coronavirus pandemic. Thanks for staying with us. Zanzibar and mainland Tanzania are due to hold elections for presidents, lawmakers, and local governments on Wednesday, October 28th. Zanzibar has previously been rocked by post-election violence in 2001, resulting in the death of more than 35 people. Both parties have now held their final rallies and at a recent gathering for the ruling CCM party, its flag bearer, Dr. Hussein Ali Mwini, appealed for peace. In the lead up to the election, opposition parties said their candidates' campaigns have been disrupted on several occasions, while dozens of parliamentary candidates were disqualified. Since 1995, there is no free and fair election in Zanzibar. And this time, 2020, is same like there is no free and fair election. Because if we're starting on a uh, re voter registration book, many, many members from ACT, from opposition, were removed. This means that uh, the, government, the, the government is not needing the free and fair election. They removed our people because they need, uh, they need to chip in. So, I don't think that there is no there, there is fair and fair election. There is disquiet. Uh, there is a heavy contingent of uh, you know anti-riot uh, police and military that has been deployed to Zanzibar, especially Pemba. And so one thing that I know is that there is tension. So I hope that things go well. But from the look of things, is that uh, there is uh, tension that is building up. Meanwhile, the UN Climate Agency says floods, droughts, hotter weather, and a desert locust invasion are hitting Africa hard, and worse is ahead for the region's food supplies, economy, and health. Temperatures have been rising on the continent of 1.2 billion people at a comparable rate to other regions, but Africa is exceptionally vulnerable to the shock. Now, that's according to the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. It adds that natural disasters such as Cyclones Edai and Kenneth, which struck three countries in southern Africa in 2019, underscores the region's exposure. When we look at the data, it is inequivocal. Africa is warming. Uh, since uh, 1901, the continent has warmed by more than one degree Celsius. And uh, when we look at um, uh, 19, uh, 19, 2019, um, we, we see that uh, the year was uh, the third warmest 
compared with uh, uh, any previous uh, um, years we've had. And uh, we also note that um, the years 2015 and 2019 were each warmer than any particular year prior to 2014. Th that there was an increase in um, food insecure and undernourished people by 45.6%. And the predictions we have, the decadal predictions we have for the period 2020 to 2024, they're indicating uh, an increasing in terms of uh, warming. With increased uh, warming, uh, we uh, expect a reduction in terms of um, uh, food production. Nigeria's High Commissioner to South Africa, Ambassador Kabiru Bala, has made an appeal for improved citizen-to-citizen -citizen relations between Nigeria and South Africa. Now, he was speaking in Johannesburg as the Nigerian community bid farewell to the outgoing Council General, Minister Godwin Adama, who has also appealed to Nigerians in South Africa to be more involved in the communities they live and work in to deepen social cohesion and avert tense situations that lead to xenophobic attacks. It was a night of tributes as various Nigerian groupings and individuals turned out as much as COVID-19 would allow to be the Consul General. Mr. Godwin Adama, goodbye. We have gathered here to give honor to whom honor is due and to showcase our respect and appreciation to a man who worked tirelessly to ensure that our people resident in South Africa here received better services and treatment. It is up to you to spread a story that truly represents who we are as a people. Many more had a lot to say to and about the man who had overseen the welfare of Nigerians in South Africa for three years. Is a man who is filled with passion, passion for the work of God to advance forward. And uh, he showed that passion in this nation of South Africa. Nigeria's High Commissioner to South Africa, Ambassador Kabir Bala, commended the outgoing Consul General for all he's done not just for Nigerian citizens, but also his efforts at improving relations between Nigerians and South Africans, an area, he says, must continue to be improved. When you look at our relationship with this country, you will see that, yes, at the political level, we have good relations. But when it comes to people-to-people -to -people relationship, I think, there is a lot that needs to be done. I am humbled that you will place your faith and trust in me. The outgoing Consul General, Mr. Godwin Adama, quite grateful for all the kind words and gifts he received, says he leaves South Africa with a fantastic learning experience. He's done a lot to um, mend fences, bring people together, not just on the Nigerian side, but bringing South Africans and Nigeria together. He's done us very proud in South Africa, who's accommodated every Nigerian, who's been there for us every time to be with us when we are happy and also to be with us when we had problems. Earlier we spoke to him in his office where he appealed to Nigerians in South Africa to live as one, contributing positively to their host communities. And I also advise them to at least mix up with the community, participate in community projects and discussions, be interested in what is happening in the various communities that you live. That will enable them to identify you as somebody that is different from the few criminals they see on the street. Mr. Adama this Monday formally handed over to his successor, Mr. Abdul Malik Michael Ahmed, who now resumes as Nigeria's Consul General in Johannesburg. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News.
finally on the program, Italian tenor Andrea Bocelli performed on the steps of Sicily's Noto Cathedral on Saturday evening. The show, organized in line with anti-contagion regulations from COVID-19, is aimed to launch a message of strength and union among the seven UNESCO sites in Sicily. The tenor was accompanied by the orchestra and the choir of the theater, Massimo Bellini of Catalina. Well, thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Akaite Afia. Stay safe.